Section 13 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 13. Treaty of Peace mexican bullfights regimental quartermaster trip to popocatapel trip to the caves of mexico the treaty of peace between the two countries was signed by the commissioners on each side early in february eighteen forty eight it took a considerable time for it to reach washington receive the approval of the administration and be finally ratified by the senate it was naturally supposed by the army that there would be no more fighting and officers and men were of course anxious to get home but knowing there must be delay they contended themselves as best they could every sunday there was a bullfight for the amusement of those who would pay their fifty cents i attended one of them just one not wishing to leave the country without having witnessed the national sport the sight to me was sickening i could not see how human beings could enjoy the sufferings of beasts and often of men as they seemed to do on these occasions at these sports there are usually from four to six bulls sacrificed the audience occupies seats around the ring in which the exhibition is given each seat but the foremost rising higher than the one in front so that every one can get a full view of the sport when all is ready a bull is turned into the ring three or four men come in mounted on the merest skeletons of horses blind or blindfolded and so weak that they could not make a sudden turn with their riders without danger of falling down the men are armed with spears having a point as sharp as a needle other men enter the arena on foot armed with red flags and explosives about the size of a musket cartridge to each of these explosives is fastened a barbed needle which serves the purpose of attaching them to the bull by running the needle into the skin before the animal is turned loose a lot of these explosives are attached to him the pain from the pricking of the skin by the needles is exasperating but when the explosions of the cartridges commence the animal becomes frantic as he makes a lunge towards one horseman another runs a spear into him he turns towards his last tormentor when a man on foot holds out a red flag the bull rushes for this and is allowed to take it on his horns the flag drops and covers the eyes of the animal so that he is at a loss what to do it is jerked from him and the torment is renewed when the animal is worked into an uncontrollable frenzy the horsemen withdraw and the matadors literally murderers enter armed with knives having blades twelve or eighteen inches long and sharp the trick is to dodge an attack from the animal and stab him to the heart as he passes if these efforts fail the bull is finally lassoed held fast and killed by driving a knife blade into the spinal column just back of the horns he is then dragged out by horses or mules another is let into the ring and the same performance is renewed on the occasion when i was present one of the bulls was not turned aside by the attacks in the rear the presentations of the red flag etc etc but kept right on and placing his horns under the flanks of a horse threw him and his rider to the ground with great force the horse was killed and the rider lay prostrate as if dead 
the bull was then lassoed and killed in the manner above described men came in and carried the dead man off in a litter when the slaughtered bull and horse were dragged out a fresh bull was turned into the ring conspicuous among the spectators was the man who had been carried out on the litter but a few minutes before he was only dead so far as that performance went but the corpse was so lively that it could not forego the chance of witnessing the discomfiture of some of his brethren who might not be so fortunate there was a feeling of disgust manifested by the audience to find that he had come to life again i confess that i felt sorry to see the cruelty to the bull and the horse i did not stay for the conclusion of the performance but while i did stay there was not a bull killed in the prescribed way bullfights are now prohibited in the federal district embracing a territory around the city of mexico somewhat larger than the district of columbia and they are not an institution in any part of the country during one of my recent visits to mexico bullfights were got up in my honor at puebla and at pachuca i was not notified in advance so as to be able to decline and thus prevent the performance but in both cases i civilly declined to attend another amusement of the people of mexico of that day and one which nearly all indulged in male and female old and young priest and layman was monte playing regular feast weeks were held every year at what was then known as st augustine tilopum eleven miles out of town there were dealers to suit every class and condition of people in many of the booths placos the copper coin of the country four of them making six and a quarter cents of our money were piled up in great quantities with some silver to accommodate the people who could not bet more than a few pennies at a time in other booths silver formed the bulk of the capital of the bank with a few doubloons to be changed if there should be a run of luck against the bank in some there was no coin except gold here the rich were said to bet away their entire estates in a single day all this is stopped now for myself i was kept somewhat busy during the winter of eighteen forty seven eighteen forty eight my regiment was stationed at Takabaye. i was regimental quartermaster and commissary general scott had been unable to get clothing for the troops from the north the men were becoming well they needed clothing material had to be purchased such as could be obtained and people employed to make it up into yankee uniforms a quartermaster in the city was designated to attend to this special duty but clothing was so much needed that it was seized as fast as made up a regiment was glad to get a dozen suits at a time i had to look after this matter for the fourth infantry then our regimental fund had run down and some of the musicians in the band had been without their extra pay for a number of months the regimental bands at that day were kept up partly by pay from the government and partly by pay from the regimental fund there was authority of law for enlisting a certain number of men as musicians so many could receive the pay of non-commissioned officers of the various grades and the remainder the pay of privates this would not secure a band leader nor good players on certain instruments in garrison there are various ways of keeping up a regimental fund sufficient to give extra pay to musicians establish libraries and tin-pin alleys subscribe to magazines and furnish many extra comforts to the men the best device for supplying the fund is to issue bread to the soldiers instead of flour the ration used to be eighteen ounces per day of either flour or bread 
and one hundred pounds of flour will make one hundred and forty pounds of bread this saving was purchased by the commissary for the benefit of the fund in the emergency the fourth infantry was laboring under i rented a bakery in the city hired bakers mexicans bought fuel and whatever was necessary and i also got a contract from the chief commissary of the army for baking a large amount of hard bread in two months i made more money for the fund than my pay amounted to during the entire war while stationed at monterey i had relieved the post fund in the same way there however was no profit except in the saving of flour by converting it into bread in the spring of eighteen forty eight a party of officers obtained leave to visit popocatapel the highest volcano in america and to take an escort i went with the party many of whom afterwards occupied conspicuous positions before the country of those who went south and attained high rank there was lieutenant richard anderson who commanded a corps at spotsylvania captain sibley a major general and after the war for a number of years in the employ of the khedive of egypt captain george crittenden a rebel general s b buckner who surrendered fort donelson and mansfield lovell who commanded at new orleans before that city fell into the hands of the national troops of those who remained on our side there were captain andrew porter lieutenant c p stone and lieutenant z b tower there were quite a number of other officers whose names i cannot recollect at a little village Uzomba, near the base of popocatapel where we proposed to commence the ascent we procured guides and two pack mules with forage for our horses high up on the mountain there was a deserted house of one room called the vaqueria which had been occupied years before by men in charge of cattle ranging on the mountain the pasturage up there was very fine when we saw it and there were still some cattle descendants of the former domestic herd which had now become wild it was possible to go on horseback as far as the vaqueria though the road was somewhat hazardous in places sometimes it was very narrow with a yawning precipice on one side hundreds of feet down to a roaring mountain torrent below and almost perpendicular walls on the other side at one of these places one of our mules loaded with two sacks of barley one on each side the two about as big as he was struck his load against the mountain side and was precipitated to the bottom the descent was steep but not perpendicular the mule rolled over and over until the bottom was reached and we supposed of course the poor animal was dashed to pieces what was our surprise not long after we had gone into bivouac to see the lost mule cargo and owner coming up the ascent the load had protected the animal from serious injury and his owner had gone after him and found a way back to the path leading up to the hut where we were to stay the night at the vaqueria was one of the most unpleasant i ever knew it was very cold and the rain fell in torrents a little higher up the rain ceased and snow began the wind blew with great velocity the log cabin we were in had lost the roof entirely on one side and on the other it was hardly better than a sieve there was little or no sleep that night as soon as it was light the next morning we started to make the ascent to the summit the wind continued to blow with violence and the weather was still cloudy but there was neither rain nor snow the clouds however concealed from our view the country below us except at times a momentary glimpse could be got through a clear space between them 
the wind carried the loose snow around the mountain sides in such volumes as to make it almost impossible to stand up against it we labored on and on until it became evident that the top could not be reached before night if at all in such a storm and we concluded to return the descent was easy and rapid though dangerous until we got below the snow line at the cabin we mounted our horses and by night were at uzumba the fatigues of the day and the loss of sleep the night before drove us to bed early our beds consisted of a place on the dirt floor with a blanket under us soon all were asleep but long before morning first one and then another of our party began to cry out with excruciating pain in the eyes not one escaped it by morning the eyes of half of the party were so swollen that they were entirely closed the others suffered pain equally the feeling was about what might be expected from the prick of a sharp needle at a white heat we remained in quarters until the afternoon bathing our eyes in cold water this relieved us very much and before night the pain had entirely left the swelling however continued and about half the party still had their eyes entirely closed but we concluded to make a start back those who could see a little leading the horses of those who could not see at all we moved back to the village of amica amica some six miles and stopped again for the night the next morning all were entirely well and free from pain the weather was clear and popocatapel stood out in all its beauty the top looking as if not a mile away and inviting us to return about half the party were anxious to try the ascent again and concluded to do so the remainder i was with the remainder concluded that we had got all the pleasure there was to be had out of mountain climbing and that we would visit the great caves of mexico some ninety miles from where we then were on the road to acapulco the party that ascended the mountain the second time succeeded in reaching the crater at the top with but little of the labor they encountered in their first attempt three of them anderson stone and buckner wrote accounts of their journey which were published at the time i made no notes of this excursion and have read nothing about it since but it seems to me that i can see the whole of it as vividly as if it were but yesterday i have been back at amica amica and the village beyond twice in the last five years the scene had not changed materially from my recollection of it the party which i was with moved south down the valley to the town of quantala some forty miles from amica amica the latter stands on the plain at the foot of popocatapel at an elevation of about eight thousand feet above tidewater the slope down is gradual as the traveller moves south but one would not judge that in going to quantla descent enough had been made to occasion a material change in the climate and productions of the soil but such is the case in the morning we left a temperate climate where the cereals and fruits are those common to the united states we halted in the evening in a tropical climate where the orange and banana the coffee and the sugar cane were flourishing we had been traveling apparently on a plain all day but in the direction of the flow of water soon after the capture of the city of mexico an armistice had been agreed to designating the limits beyond which troops of the respective armies were not to go during its continuance our party knew nothing about these limits as we approached quantala bugles sounded the assembly and soldiers rushed from the guard house in the edge of the town towards us our party halted and i tied a white pocket handkerchief to a stick and using it as a flag of truce proceeded on to the town captain sibley and porter followed a few hundred yards behind 
i was detained at the guard-house until a messenger could be dispatched to the quarters of the commanding general who authorized that i should be conducted to him i had been with the general but a few minutes when the two officers following announced themselves the mexican general reminded us that it was a violation of the truce for us to be there however as we had no special authority from our own commanding general and as we knew nothing about the terms of the truce we were permitted to occupy a vacant house outside the guard for the night with the promise of a guide to put us on the road to cornavaca the next morning cornavaca is a town west of guantla the country through which we passed between these two towns is tropical in climate and productions and rich in scenery at one point about half way between the two places the road goes over a low pass in the mountains in which there is a very quaint old town the inhabitants of which at that day were nearly all full-blooded indians very few of them even spoke spanish the houses were built of stone and generally only one story high the streets were narrow and had probably been paved before cortez visited the country they had not been graded but the paving had been done on the natural surface we had with us one vehicle a cart which was probably the first wheeled vehicle that had ever passed through that town on a hill overlooking this town stands the tomb of an ancient king and it was understood that the inhabitants venerated this tomb very highly as well as the memory of the ruler who was supposed to be buried in it we ascended the mountain and surveyed the tomb but it showed no particular marks of architectural taste mechanical skill or advanced civilization the next day we went into cornavaca after a day's rest at cornavaca our party set out again on the journey to the great caves of mexico we had proceeded but a few miles when we were stopped as before by a guard and notified that the terms of the existing armistice did not permit us to go further in that direction upon convincing the guard that we were a mere party of pleasure seekers desirous of visiting the great natural curiosities of the country which we expected soon to leave we were conducted to a large hacienda near by and directed to remain there until the commanding general of that department could be communicated with and his decision obtained as to whether we should be permitted to pursue our journey the guard promised to send a messenger at once and expected a reply by night at night there was no response from the commanding general but the captain of the guard was sure he would have a reply by morning again in the morning there was no reply the second evening the same thing happened and finally we learned that the guard had sent no message or messenger to the department commander we determined therefore to go on unless stopped by a force sufficient to compel obedience after a few hours travel we came to a town where a scene similar to the one at quantia occurred the commanding officer sent a guide to conduct our party around the village and to put us upon our road again this was the last interruption that night we rested at a large coffee plantation some eight miles from the cave we were on the way to visit it must have been a saturday night the peons had been paid off and spent part of the night in gambling away their scanty week's earnings their coin was principally copper and i do not believe there was a man among them who had received as much as twenty-five cents in money they were as much excited however as if they had been staking thousands i recollect one poor fellow who had lost his last tobacco pulled off his shirt and in the most excited manner put that up on the turn of a card monte was the game played the place out of doors 
near the window of the room occupied by the officers of our party the next morning we were at the mouth of the cave at an early hour provided with guides candles and rockets we explored to a distance of about three miles from the entrance and found a succession of chambers of great dimensions and of great beauty when lit up with our rockets stalactites and stalagmites of all sizes were discovered some of the former were many feet in diameter and extended from ceiling to floor some of the latter were but a few feet high from the floor but the formation is going on constantly and many centuries hence these stalagmites will extend to the ceiling and become complete columns the stalagmites were all a little concave and the cavities were filled with water the water percolates through the roof a drop at a time often the drops several minutes apart and more or less charged with mineral matter evaporation goes on slowly leaving the mineral behind this in time makes the immense columns many of them thousands of tons in weight which serve to support the roofs over the vast chambers i recollect that at one point in the cave one of these columns is of such huge proportions that there is only a narrow passage left on either side of it some of our party became satisfied with their explorations before we had reached the point to which the guides were accustomed to take explorers and started back without guides coming to the large column spoken of they followed it entirely around and commenced retracing their steps into the bowels of the mountain without being aware of the fact when the rest of us had completed our explorations we started out with our guides but had not gone far before we saw the torches of an approaching party we could not conceive who these could be for all of us had come in together and there were none but ourselves at the entrance when we started in very soon we found it was our friends it took them some time to conceive how they had got where they were they were sure they had kept straight on for the mouth of the cave and had gone about far enough to have reached it end of section thirteen recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter fourteen return of the army marriage ordered to the pacific coast crossing the isthmus arrival at san francisco my experience in the mexican war was of great advantage to me afterwards besides the many practical lessons it taught the war brought nearly all the officers of the regular army together so as to make them personally acquainted it also brought them in contact with volunteers many of whom served in the war of the rebellion afterwards then in my particular case i had been at west point at about the right time to meet most of the graduates who were of a suitable age at the breaking out of the rebellion to be trusted with large commands graduating in eighteen forty three i was at the military academy from one to four years with all cadets who graduated between eighteen forty and eighteen forty six seven classes these classes embraced more than fifty officers who afterwards 
became generals on one side or the other in the rebellion many of them holding high commands all the older officers who became conspicuous in the rebellion i had also served with and known in mexico lee j e johnston a s johnston holmes hebert and a number of others on the confederate side mccall mansfield philip kearney and others on the national side the acquaintance thus formed was of immense service to me in the war of the rebellion i mean what i learned of the characters of those to whom i was afterward opposed i do not pretend to say that all movements or even many of them were made with special reference to the characteristics of the commander against whom they were directed but my appreciation of my enemies was certainly affected by this knowledge the natural disposition of most people is to clothe a commander of a large army whom they do not know with almost superhuman abilities a large part of the national army for instance and most of the press of the country clothed general lee with just such qualities but i had known him personally and knew that he was mortal and it was just as well that i felt this the treaty of peace was at last ratified and the evacuation of mexico by united states troops was ordered early in june the troops in the city of mexico began to move out many of them including the brigade to which i belonged were assembled at jalapa above the vomito to await the arrival of transports at vera cruz but with all this precaution my regiment and others were in camp on the sand beach in a july sun for about a week before embarking while the fever raged with great virulence in vera cruz not two miles away i can call to mind only one person an officer who died of the disease my regiment was sent to pascagoula mississippi to spend the summer as soon as it was settled in camp i obtained a leave of absence for four months and proceeded to st louis on the twenty second of august eighteen forty eight i was married to miss julia dent the lady of whom i have before spoken we visited my parents and relations in ohio and at the end of my leave proceeded to my post at sackett's harbor new york in april following i was ordered to detroit michigan where two years were spent with but few important incidents the present constitution of the state of michigan was ratified during this time by the terms of one of its provisions all citizens of the united states residing within the state at the time of the ratification became citizens of michigan also during my stay in detroit there was an election for city officers mr zachariah chandler was the candidate of the whigs for the office of mayor and was elected although the city was then reckoned democratic all the officers stationed there at the time who offered their votes were permitted to cast them i did not offer mine however as i did not wish to consider myself a citizen of michigan this was mr chandler's first entry into politics a career he followed ever after with great success and in which he died enjoying the friendship esteem and love of his countrymen in the spring of eighteen fifty one the garrison at detroit was transferred to sackett's harbor and in the following spring the entire fourth infantry was ordered to the pacific coast it was decided that mrs grant should visit my parents at first for a few months and then remain with her own family at their st louis home until an opportunity offered of sending for her in the month of april the regiment was assembled at governor's island new york harbor and on the fifth of july eight companies sailed for aspinwall 
we numbered a little over seven hundred persons including the families of officers and soldiers passage was secured for us on the old steamer ohio commanded at the time by captain schnick of the navy it had not been determined until a day or two before starting that the fourth infantry should go by the ohio consequently a complement of passengers had already been secured the addition of over seven hundred to this list crowded the steamer most uncomfortably especially for the tropics in july in eight days aspinwall was reached at that time the streets of the town were eight or ten inches under water and foot passengers passed from place to place on raised foot walks july is at the height of the wet season on the isthmus at intervals the rain would pour down in streams followed in not many minutes by a blazing tropical summer's sun these alternate changes from rain to sunshine were continuous in the afternoons i wondered how any person could live many months in aspinwall and wondered still more why any one tried in the summer of eighteen fifty two the panama railroad was completed only to the point where it now crosses the chagres river from there passengers were carried by boats to gorgona at which place they took mules for panama some twenty-five miles further those who travelled over the isthmus in those days will remember that boats on the chagres river were propelled by natives not inconveniently burdened with clothing these boats carried thirty to forty passengers each the crews consisted of six men to a boat armed with long poles there were planks wide enough for a man to walk on conveniently running along the sides of each boat from end to end the men would start from the bow place one end of their poles against the river bottom brace their shoulders against the other end and then walk to the stern as rapidly as they could in this way from a mile to a mile and a half an hour could be made against the current of the river i as regimental quartermaster had charge of the public property and had also to look after the transportation a contract had been entered into with the steamship company in new york for the transportation of the regiment to california including the isthmus transit a certain amount of baggage was allowed per man and saddle animals were to be furnished to commissioned officers and to all disabled persons the regiment with the exception of one company left as guards to the public property camp and garrison equipage principally and the soldiers with families took boats propelled as above described for gorgona from this place they marched to panama and were soon comfortably on the steamer anchored in the bay some three or four miles from the town i with one company of troops and all the soldiers with families all the tents mess chests and camp kittles was sent to cruces a town a few miles higher up the chagres river than gorgona there i found an impecunious american who had taken the contract to furnish transportation for the regiment at a stipulated price per hundred pounds for the freight and so much for each saddle animal but when we reached cruces there was not a mule either for pack or saddle in the place the contractor promised that the animals should be on hand in the morning in the morning he said that they were on the way from some imaginary place and would arrive in the course of the day this went on until i saw that he could not procure the animals at all at the price he had promised to furnish them for 
the unusual number of passengers that had come over on the steamer and the large amount of freight to pack had created an unprecedented demand for mules some of the passengers paid as high as forty dollars for the use of a mule to ride twenty-five miles when the mule would not have sold for ten dollars in that market at other times meanwhile the cholera had broken out and men were dying every hour to diminish the food for the disease i permitted the company detailed with me to proceed to panama the captain and the doctors accompanied the men and i was left alone with the sick and the soldiers who had families the regiment at panama was also affected with the disease but there were better accommodations for the well on the steamer and a hospital for those taken with the disease on an old hulk anchored a mile off there were also hospital tents on shore on the island of flamingo which stands in the bay i was about a week at cruces before transportation began to come in about one-third of the people with me died either at cruces or on the way to panama there was no agent of the transportation company at cruces to consult or to take the responsibility of procuring transportation at a price which would secure it i therefore myself dismissed the contractor and made a new contract with a native at more than double the original price thus we finally reached panama the steamer however could not proceed until the cholera abated and the regiment was detained still longer altogether on the isthmus and on the pacific side we were delayed six weeks about one-seventh of those who left new york harbor with the fourth infantry on the fifth of july now lie buried on the isthmus of panama or on flamingo island in panama bay one amusing circumstance occurred while we were lying at anchor in panama bay in the regiment there was a lieutenant slaughter who was very liable to seasickness it almost made him sick to see the wave of a tablecloth when the servants were spreading it soon after his graduation slaughter was ordered to california and took passage by a sailing vessel going around cape horn the vessel was seven months making the voyage and slaughter was sick every moment of the time never more so than while lying at anchor after reaching his place of destination on landing in california he found orders which had come by the isthmus notifying him of a mistake in his assignment he should have been ordered to the northern lakes he started back by the isthmus route and was sick all the way but when he arrived at the east he was again ordered to california this time definitely and at this date was making his third trip he was as sick as ever and had been so for more than a month while lying at anchor in the bay i remember him well seated with his elbows on the table in front of him his chin between his hands and looking the picture of despair at last he broke out i wish i had taken my father's advice he wanted me to go into the navy if i had done so i should not have had to go to sea so much poor slaughter it was his last sea voyage he was killed by indians in oregon by the last of august the cholera had so abated that it was deemed safe to start the disease did not break out again on the way to california and we reached san francisco early in september end of section fourteen recording by jim clevenger Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J O C C L E V dot com.
fifteen of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter fifteen san francisco early california experiences life on the pacific coast promoted captain flush times in california san francisco at that day was a lively place gold or placer digging as it was called was at its height steamers plied daily between san francisco and both stockton and sacramento passengers in gold from the southern mines came by the stockton boat from the northern mines by sacramento in the evening when these boats arrived long wharf there was but one wharf in san francisco in eighteen fifty two was alive with people crowding to meet the miners as they came down to sell their dust and to have a time of these some were runners for hotels boarding houses or restaurants others belonged to a class of impecunious adventurers of good manners and good presence who were ever on the alert to make the acquaintance of people with some ready means in the hope of being asked to take a meal at a restaurant many were young men of good family good education and gentlemanly instincts their parents had been able to support them during their minority and to give them good educations but not to maintain them afterwards from eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty three there was a rush of people to the pacific coast of the class described all thought that fortunes were to be picked up without effort in the gold fields on the pacific some realized more than their most sanguine expectations but for one such there were hundreds disappointed many of whom now fill unknown graves others died wrecks of their former selves and many without a vicious instinct became criminals and outcasts many of the real scenes in early california life exceed in strangeness and interest any of the mere products of the brain of the novelist those early days in california brought out character it was a long way off then and the journey was expensive the fortunate could go by cape horn or by the isthmus of panama but the mass of pioneers crossed the plains with their ox teams this took an entire summer they were very lucky when they got through with a yoke of worn-out cattle all other means were exhausted in procuring the outfit on the missouri river the immigrant on arriving found himself a stranger in a strange land far from friends time pressed for the little means that could be realized from the sale of what was left of the outfit would not support a man long at california prices many became discouraged others would take off their coats and look for a job no matter what it might be these succeeded as a rule there were many young men who had studied professions before they went to california and who had never done a day's manual labor in their lives who took in the situation at once and went to work to make a start at anything they could get to do some supplied carpenters and masons with material carrying plank brick or mortar as the case might be others drove stages drays or baggage wagons until they could do better more became discouraged early and spent their time looking up people who would treat or lounging about restaurants and gambling houses where free lunches were furnished daily they were welcomed at these places because they often brought in miners who proved good customers 
my regiment spent a few weeks at Venetia Barracks, and then was ordered to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, then in Oregon Territory. During the winter of 1852-1853, the territory was divided, all north of the Columbia River being taken from Oregon to make Washington Territory. Prices for all kinds of supplies were so high on the Pacific coast from 1849 until at least 1853 that it would have been impossible for officers of the army to exist upon their pay if it had not been that authority was given them to purchase from the commissary such supplies as he kept at New Orleans wholesale prices. A cook could not be hired for the pay of a captain. The cook could do better. At Benicia, in 1852, flour was 25 cents per pound, potatoes were 16 cents, beets, turnips, and cabbage 6 cents, onions 37 and one half cents, meat and other articles in proportion. In 1853, at Vancouver, vegetables were a little lower, I, with three other officers, concluded that we would raise a crop for ourselves and by selling the surplus realize something handsome. I bought a pair of horses that had crossed the plains that summer and were very poor. They recuperated rapidly, however, and proved a good team to break up the ground with. I performed all the labor of breaking up the ground while the other officers planted the potatoes. Our crop was enormous. Luckily for us, the Columbia River rose to a great height from the melting of the snow in the mountains in June, and overflowed and killed most of our crop. This saved digging it up for everybody on the Pacific coast seemed to have come to the conclusion at the same time that agriculture would be profitable. In 1853, more than three-quarters of the potatoes raised were permitted to rot in the ground, or had to be thrown away. The only potatoes we sold were to our own mess. While I was stationed on the Pacific coast, we were free from Indian wars. There were quite a number of remnants of tribes in the vicinity of Portland in Oregon, and of Fort Vancouver in Washington Territory. They had generally acquired some of the vices of civilization, but none of the virtues except in individual cases. The Hudson Bay Company had held the Northwest with their trading post for many years before the United States was represented on the Pacific coast. They still retained posts along the Columbia River, and one at Fort Vancouver when I was there. Their treatment of the Indians had brought out the better qualities of the savages. Farming had been undertaken by the company to supply the Indians with bread and vegetables. They raised some cattle and horses, and they had now taught the Indians to do the labor of the farm and herd. They always compensated them for their labor, and always gave them goods of uniform quality and at uniform price. Before the advent of the American, the medium of exchange between the Indian and the white man was pelts. Afterward, it was silver coin. If an Indian received in the sale of a horse a fifty-dollar gold piece, not an infrequent occurrence, the first thing he did was to exchange it for American half-dollars. These he could count. He would then commence his purchases, paying for each article separately as he got it. He would not trust anyone to add up the bill and pay it all at once. At that day, fifty-dollar gold pieces, not the issue of the government, were common on the Pacific coast. They were called slugs. The Indians along the lower Columbia as far as the Cascades and on the lower Willamette died off very fast during the year I spent in that section. For besides acquiring the vices of the white people, they had acquired also their diseases. The measles and the smallpox, 
were both amazingly fatal. In their wild state, before the appearance of the white man among them, the principal complaints they were subject to were those produced by long involuntary fasting, violent exercise in pursuit of game, and overeating. Instinct more than reason had taught them a remedy for these ills. It was the steam bath. Something like a bake oven was built, large enough to admit a man lying down. Bushes were stuck in the ground in two rows, about six feet long and some two or three feet apart. Other bushes connected the rows at one end. The tops of the bushes were drawn together to interlace and confined in that position. The hole was then plastered over with wet clay until every opening was filled. Just inside the open end of the oven the floor was scooped out so as to make a hole that would hold a bucket or two of water. These ovens were always built on the banks of a stream, a big spring, or pool of water. When a patient required a bath, a fire was built near the oven and a pile of stones put upon it. The cavity at the front was then filled with water. When the stones were sufficiently heated, the patient would draw himself into the oven, a blanket would be thrown over the open end, and hot stones put into the water until the patient could stand it no longer. He was then withdrawn from his steam bath and doused into the cold stream nearby. This treatment may have answered with early ailments of the Indians. With the measles or smallpox, it would kill every time. During my year on the Columbia River, the smallpox exterminated one small remnant of a band of Indians entirely and reduced others materially. I do not think there was a case of recovery among them until the doctor with the Hudson Bay Company took the matter in hand and established a hospital. Nearly every case he treated recovered. I never myself saw the treatment described in the preceding paragraph, but have heard it described by persons who have witnessed it. The decimation among the Indians I knew of personally, and the hospital established for their benefit, was a Hudson Bay building, not a stone's throw from my own quarters. The death of Colonel Bliss of the Adjutant General's Department, which occurred July 5th, 1853, promoted me to the captaincy of a company then stationed at Humboldt Bay, California. The notice reached me in September of the same year, and I very soon started to join my new command. There was no way of reaching Humboldt at that time except to take passage on a San Francisco sailing vessel going after lumber, redwood, a species of cedar which, on the Pacific coast, takes the place filled by white pine in the east, then abounded on the banks of Humboldt Bay. There were extensive sawmills engaged in preparing this lumber for the San Francisco market, and sailing vessels used in getting it to market furnished the only means of communication between Humboldt and the balance of the world. I was obliged to remain in San Francisco for several days before I found a vessel. This gave me a good opportunity of comparing the San Francisco of 1852 with that of 1853. As before stated, there had been but one wharf in front of the city in 1852, Long Wharf. In 1853, the town had grown out into the bay beyond what was the end of this wharf when I first saw it. Streets and houses had been built out on piles where the year before the largest vessels visiting the port lay at anchor or tied to the wharf. There was no filling under the streets or houses. San Francisco presented the same general appearance as the year before, that is, eating, drinking, and gambling houses were conspicuous for their number and publicity. They were on the first floor, with doors wide open. 
At all hours of the day and night, in walking the streets, the eye was regaled on every block near the waterfront by the sight of players at faro. Often, broken places were found in the street large enough to let a man down into the water below. I have but little doubt that many of the people who went to the Pacific coast in the early days of the gold excitement, and have never been heard from since, or who were heard from for a time, and then ceased to write, found watery graves beneath the houses or streets built over San Francisco Bay. Besides the gambling in cards, there was gambling on a larger scale in city lots. These were sold on change, much as stocks are now sold on Wall Street. Cash, at time of purchase, was always paid by the broker, but the purchaser had only to put up his margin. He was charged at the rate of two or three per cent a month on the difference, besides commissions. The sand hills, some of them almost inaccessible to foot passengers, were surveyed off and mapped into fifty vara lots, a vara being a Spanish yard. These were sold at first at very low prices, but were sold and resold for higher prices until they went up to many thousands of dollars. The brokers did a fine business, and so did many such purchasers as were sharp enough to quit purchasing before the final crash came. As the city grew, the sand hills back of the town furnished material for filling up the bay under the houses and streets, and still further out. The temporary houses, first built over the water in the harbor, soon gave way to more solid structures. The main business part of the city now is on solid ground, made where vessels of the largest class lay at anchor in the early days. I was in San Francisco again in 1854. Gambling houses had disappeared from public view. The city had become staid and orderly. End of section 15. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Of personal memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 16 Resignation Private Life Life at Galena The Coming Crisis My family, all this while, was at the East. It consisted now of a wife and two children. I saw no chance of supporting them on the Pacific coast out of my pay as an army officer. I concluded, therefore, to resign, and in March applied for a leave of absence until the end of July following, tendering my resignation to take effect at the end of that time. I left the Pacific coast very much attached to it, and with the full expectation of making it my future home. That expectation and that hope remained uppermost in my mind until the Lieutenant General C. Bill was introduced into Congress in the winter of 1863-1864. The passage of that bill and my promotion blasted my last hope of ever becoming a citizen of the further west. In the late summer of 1854, I rejoined my family to find in it a son whom I had never seen, born while I was on the Isthmus of Panama. I was now to commence, at the age of thirty-two, a new struggle for our support. My wife had a farm near St. Louis, to which we went, but I had no means to stock it. A house had to be built also, 
I worked very hard, never losing a day because of bad weather, and accomplished the object in a moderate way. If nothing else could be done, I would load a cord of wood on a wagon and take it to the city for sale. I managed to keep along very well until 1858, when I was attacked by fever and ague. I had suffered very severely and for a long time from this disease while a boy in Ohio. It lasted now over a year, and, while it did not keep me in the house, it did interfere greatly with the amount of work I was able to perform. In the fall of 1858, I sold out my stock, crops, and farming utensils at auction, and gave up farming. In the winter, I established a partnership with Harry Boggs, a cousin of Mrs. Grant, in the real estate agency business. I spent that winter at St. Louis myself, but did not take my family into town until the spring. Our business might have become prosperous if I had been able to wait for it to grow. As it was, there was no more than one person could attend to, and not enough to support two families. While a citizen of St. Louis, and engaged in the real estate agency business, I was a candidate for the office of county engineer, an office of respectability and emolument, which would have been very acceptable to me at that time. The incumbent was appointed by the county court, which consisted of five members. My opponent had the advantage of birth over me. He was a citizen by adoption, and carried off the prize. I now withdrew from the co-partnership with Boggs, and in May 1860 removed to Galena, Illinois, and took a clerkship in my father's store. While a citizen of Missouri, my first opportunity for casting a vote at a presidential election occurred. I had been in the army from before attaining my majority, and had thought but little about politics, although I was a Whig by education and a great admirer of Mr. Clay. But the Whig party had ceased to exist before I had an opportunity of exercising the privilege of casting a ballot. The Know-Nothing party had taken its place, but was on the wane, and the Republican party was in a chaotic state, and had not yet received a name. It had no existence in the slave states, except at points on the borders next to free states. In St. Louis City and County, what afterwards became the Republican Party was known as the Free Soil Democracy, led by the Honorable Frank P. Blair. Most of my neighbors had known me as an officer of the Army with Whig proclivities. They had been on the same side, and on the death of their party, many had become know-nothings or members of the American Party. There was a lodge near my new home, and I was invited to join it. I accepted the invitation, was initiated, attended a meeting just one week later, and never went to another afterwards. I have no apologies to make for having been one week a member of the American Party, for I still think native-born citizens of the United States should have as much protection, as many privileges in their native country, as those who voluntarily select it for a home. But all secret, oath-bound political parties are dangerous to any nation, no matter how pure or how patriotic the motives and principles which first bring them together. No political party can or ought to exist when one of its cornerstones is opposition to freedom of thought and to the right to worship God according to the dictate of one's own conscience, or according to the creed of any religious denomination, whatever. 
Nevertheless, if a sect sets up its laws as binding above the state laws, wherever the two come in conflict, this claim must be resisted and suppressed at whatever cost. Up to the Mexican War, there were a few out-and-out -out abolitionists, men who carried their hostility to slavery into all elections from those for a justice of the peace up to the presidency of the United States. They were noisy, but not numerous. But the great majority of people at the North, where slavery did not exist, were opposed to the institution and looked upon its existence in any part of the country as unfortunate. They did not hold the states where slavery existed responsible for it, and believed that protection should be given to the right of property in slaves until some satisfactory way could be reached to be rid of the institution. Opposition to slavery was not a creed of either political party. In some sections, more anti-slavery men belonged to the Democratic Party, and in others to the Whigs. But with the inauguration of the Mexican War, in fact, with the annexation of Texas, the inevitable conflict commenced. As the time for the presidential election of 1856, the first at which I had the opportunity of voting, approached, party feeling began to run high. The Republican Party was regarded in the South and the border states not only as opposed to the extension of slavery, but as favoring the compulsory abolition of the institution without compensation to the owners. The most horrible visions seemed to present themselves to the minds of people who, one would suppose, ought to have known better. Many educated and otherwise sensible persons appeared to believe that emancipation meant social equality. Treason to the government was openly advocated and was not rebuked. It was evident to my mind that the election of a Republican president in 1856 meant the secession of all the slave states and rebellion. Under these circumstances, I preferred the success of a candidate whose election would prevent or postpone secession to seeing the country plunged into a war the end of which no man could foretell. With a Democrat elected by the unanimous vote of the slave states, there could be no pretext for secession for four years. I very much hoped that the passions of the people would subside in that time, and the catastrophe be averted altogether. If it was not, I believed the country would be better prepared to receive the shock and to resist it. I therefore voted for James Buchanan for president. Four years later, the Republican Party was successful in electing its candidate to the presidency. The civilized world has learned the consequence. Four millions of human beings held as chattels have been liberated. The ballot has been given to them. The free schools of the country have been opened to their children. The nation still lives and the people are just as free to avoid social intimacy with the blacks as ever they were, or as they are with white people. While living in Galena, I was nominally only a clerk supporting myself and family on a stipulated salary. In reality, my position was different. My father had never lived in Galena himself, but had established my two brothers there. The one next younger than myself in charge of the business, assisted by the youngest. When I went there, it was my father's intention to give up all connection with the business himself and to establish his three sons in it. But the brother who had really built up the business was sinking with consumption, and it was not thought best to make any change while he 
was in this condition. He lived until September 1861, when he succumbed to that insidious disease which always flatters its victims into the belief that they are growing better up to the close of life. A more honorable man never transacted business. In September 1861, I was engaged in an employment which required all my attention elsewhere. During the eleven months that I lived in Galena, prior to the first call for volunteers, I had been strictly attentive to my business, and had made but few acquaintances other than customers and people engaged in the same line with myself. When the election took place in November 1860, I had not been a resident of Illinois long enough to gain citizenship, and could not therefore vote. I was really glad of this at the time, for my pledges would have compelled me to vote for Stephen A. Douglas, who had no possible chance of election. The contest was really between Mr. Breckinridge and Mr. Lincoln, between minority rule and rule by the majority. I wanted, as between these candidates, to see Mr. Lincoln elected. Excitement ran high during the canvass, and torchlight processions enlivened the scene in the generally quiet streets of Galena many nights during the campaign. I did not parade with either party, but occasionally met with the Wide Awakes, Republicans, in their rooms and superintended their drill. It was evident from the time of the Chicago nomination to the close of the canvass, that the election of the Republican candidate would be the signal for some of the southern states to secede. I still had hopes that the four years which had elapsed since the first nomination of a presidential candidate by a party distinctly opposed to slavery extension had given time for the extreme pro-slavery sentiment to cool down, for the Southerners to think well before they took the awful leap which they had so vehemently threatened. But I was mistaken. The Republican candidate was elected, and solid, substantial people of the Northwest, and I presume the same order of people throughout the entire North, felt very serious but determined after this event. It was very much discussed whether the South would carry out its threat to secede and set up a separate government, the cornerstone of which should be protection to the divine institution of slavery. For there were people who believed in the divinity of human slavery, as there are now people who believe Mormonism and polygamy to be ordained by the Most High. We forgive them for entertaining such notions, but forbid their practice. It was generally believed that there would be a flurry, that some of the extreme southern states would go so far as to pass ordinances of secession, but the common impression was that this step was so plainly suicidal for the South that the movement would not spread over much of the territory and would not last long. Doubtless, the founders of our government, the majority of them at least, regarded the confederation of the colonies as an experiment. Each colony considered itself a separate government, that the confederation was for mutual protection against a foreign foe and the prevention of strife and war among themselves. If there had been a desire on the part of any single state to withdraw from the compact at any time, while the number of states was limited to the original thirteen, I do not suppose there would have been any to contest the right, no matter how much the determination might have been regretted. The problem changed on the ratification of the Constitution 
by all the colonies. It changed still more when amendments were added, and if the right of any one state to withdraw continued to exist at all after the ratification of the Constitution, it certainly ceased on the formation of new states, at least so far as the new states themselves were concerned. It was never possessed at all by Florida or the states west of the Mississippi, all of which were purchased by the treasury of the entire nation, Texas and the territory brought into the Union, in consequence of annexation, were purchased with both blood and treasure, and Texas, with a domain greater than that of any European state except Russia, was permitted to retain as state property all the public lands within its borders. It would have been ingratitude and injustice of the most flagrant sort for this state to withdraw from the Union after all that had been spent and done to introduce her. Yet, if separation had actually occurred, Texas must necessarily have gone with the South, both on account of her institutions and her geographical position secession was illogical as well as impracticable it was revolution now the right of revolution is an inherent one when people are oppressed by their government it is a natural right they enjoy to relieve themselves of the oppression if they are strong enough either by withdrawal from it or by overthrowing it and substituting a government more acceptable. But any people, or part of a people, who resort to this remedy, stake their lives, their property, and every claim for protection given by citizenship on the issue. Victory, or the conditions imposed by the conqueror, must be the result. In the case of the war between the states, it would have been the exact truth if the south had said we do not want to live with you northern people any longer we know our institution of slavery is obnoxious to you and as you are growing numerically stronger than we it may at some time in the future be in danger so long as you permitted us to control the government and with the aid of a few friends at the north to enact laws constituting your section a guard against the escape of our property we were willing to live with you you have been submissive to our rule heretofore but it looks now as if you did not intend to continue so we will remain in the union no longer instead of this the seceding states cried lustily let us alone. You have no constitutional power to interfere with us. Newspapers and people at the North reiterated the cry. Individuals might ignore the Constitution, but the nation itself must not only obey it, but must enforce the strictest construction of that instrument, the construction put upon it by the Southerners themselves. The fact is, the Constitution did not apply to any such contingency as the one existing from 1861 to 1865. Its framers never dreamed of such a contingency occurring. If they had foreseen it, the probabilities are, they would have sanctioned the right of a state or states to withdraw, rather than that there should be war between brothers. The framers were wise in their generation, and wanted to do the very best possible to secure their own liberty and independence, and that also of their descendants to the latest days. It is preposterous to suppose that the people of one generation can lay down the best and only rules of government for all who are to come after them and under unforeseen contingencies. 
At the time of the framing of our Constitution, the only physical forces that had been subdued and made to serve man and do his labor were the currents in the streams and in the air we breathe. Rude machinery, propelled by water power, had been invented. Sails to propel ships upon the waters had been set to catch the passing breeze. But the application of stream to propel vessels against both wind and current, and machinery to do all manner of work, had not been thought of. The instantaneous transmission of messages around the world by means of electricity would probably at that day have been attributed to witchcraft or a league with the devil. Immaterial circumstances had changed as greatly as material ones. We could not, and ought not, to be rigidly bound by the rules laid down under circumstances so different for emergencies so utterly unanticipated. The fathers themselves would have been the first to declare that their prerogatives were not irrevocable. They would surely have resisted secession could they have lived to see the shape it assumed. I traveled through the northwest considerably during the winter of 1860-1861. We had customers in all the little towns in southwest Wisconsin, southeast Minnesota, and northeast Iowa. These generally knew I had been a captain in the regular army and had served through the Mexican War. Consequently, wherever I stopped at night, some of the people would come to the public house where I was and sit till a late hour discussing the probabilities of the future. My own views at that time were like those officially expressed by Mr. Seward at a later day that the war would be over in ninety days. I continued to entertain these views until after the Battle of Shiloh. I believe now that there would have been no more battles at the West after the capture of Fort Donelson if all the troops in that region had been under a single commander who would have followed up that victory. There is little doubt in my mind now that the prevailing sentiment of the South would have been opposed to secession in 1860 and 1861 if there had been a fair and calm expression of opinion, unbiased by threats, and if the ballot of one legal voter had counted for as much as that of any other. But there was no calm discussion of the question. Demagogues, who were too old to enter the army, if there should be a war, others who entertained so high an opinion of their own ability that they did not believe they could be spared from the direction of the affairs of state in such an event, declaimed vehemently and increasingly against the North, against its aggressions upon the south its interference with southern rights etc etc they denounced the northerners as cowards poltroons negro worshippers claimed that one southern man was equal to five northern men in battle that if the South would stand up for its rights, the North would back down. Mr. Jefferson Davis said, in a speech delivered at LaGrange, Mississippi, before the cessation of that state, that he would agree to drink all the blood spilled south of Mason and Dixon's line if there should be a war. The young men, who would have the fighting to do in case of war, believed all these statements, both in regard to the aggressiveness of the North and its cowardice. They, too, 
cried out for a separation from such people. The great bulk of the legal voters of the South were men who owned no slaves. Their homes were generally in the hills and poor country. Their facilities for educating their children, even up to the point of reading and writing, were very limited. Their interest in the contest was very meager. What there was, if they had been capable of seeing it, was with the North. They, too, needed emancipation. Under the old regime, they were looked down upon by those who controlled all the affairs of the interest of slave owners as poor white trash who were allowed the ballot so long as they cast it according to direction i am aware that this last statement may be disputed an individual testimony perhaps adduced to show that in antebellum days the ballot was as untrammeled in the south as in any section of the country but in the face of any such contradiction i reassert the statement the shotgun was not resorted to masked men did not ride over the country at night intimidating voters but there was a firm feeling that a class existed in every state with a sort of divine right to control public affairs. If they could not get this control by one means, they must by another. The end justified the means. The coercion, if mild, was complete. There were two political parties, it is true, in all the states, both strong in numbers and respectability, but both equally loyal to the institution which stood paramount in southern eyes to all other institutions in state or nation. The slave owners were the minority, but governed both parties. Had politics ever divided the slaveholders and the non-slaveholders, the majority would have been obliged to yield, or internecine war would have been the consequence. I do not know that the southern people were to blame for this condition of affairs. There was a time when slavery was not profitable, and the discussion of the merits of the institution was confined almost exclusively to the territory where it existed. The states of Virginia and Kentucky came near abolishing slavery by their own acts, one state defeating the measure by a tie vote, and the other only lacking one. But when the institution became profitable, all talk of its abolition ceased where it existed, and naturally, as human nature is constituted, arguments were adduced in its support. The cotton gin probably had much to do with the justification of slavery. The winter of 1860-1861 will be remembered by middle-aged people of today as one of great excitement. South Carolina promptly seceded after the result of the presidential election was known. Other southern states proposed to follow. In some of them, the Union sentiment was so strong that it had to be suppressed by force. Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, all slave states, failed to pass ordinances of secession, but they were all represented in the so-called Congress of the so-called Confederate States. The governor and lieutenant governor of Missouri in 1861, Jackson and Reynolds, were both supporters of the rebellion and took refuge with the enemy. The governor soon died, and the lieutenant governor assumed his office, issued proclamations as governor of the state, was recognized as such by the Confederate government, and continued his pretensions until the collapse of the rebellion. 
the South claimed the sovereignty of states, but claimed the right to coerce into their confederation such states as they wanted, that is, all the states where slavery existed. They did not seem to think this course inconsistent. The fact is, the southern slave owners believed that, in some way, the ownership of slaves conferred a sort of patent of nobility, a right to govern independent of the interest or wishes of those who did not hold such property. They convinced themselves, first, of the divine origin of the institution, and, next, that that particular institution was not safe in the hands of any body of legislators but themselves. Meanwhile, the administration of President Buchanan looked helplessly on and proclaimed that the general government had no power to interfere, that the nation had no power to save its own life. Mr. Buchanan had in his cabinet two members at least who were as earnest to use a mild term, in the cause of secession as Mr. Davis or any southern statesman. One of them, Floyd, the Secretary of War, scattered the army so that much of it could be captured when hostilities should commence, and distributed the cannon and small arms from northern arsenals throughout the south so as to be on hand when treason wanted them. The Navy was scattered in like manner. The President did not prevent his cabinet preparing for war upon their government, either by destroying its resources or storing them in the South until a de facto government was established with Jefferson Davis as his President, and Montgomery, Alabama as the capital. The secessionists had then to leave the cabinet. In their own estimation, they were aliens in the country which had given them birth. Loyal men were put into their places. Treason in the executive branch of the government was stopped. But the harm had already been done. The stable door was locked after the horse had been stolen. During all the trying winter of 1860-1861, when the Southerners were so defiant that they would not allow within their borders the expression of a sentiment hostile to their views. It was a brave man indeed who could stand up and proclaim his loyalty to the Union. On the other hand, men at the North, prominent men, proclaimed that the government had no power to coerce the South into submission to the laws of the land, that if the North undertook to raise armies to go south, these armies would have to march over the dead bodies of the speakers. A portion of the press of the North was constantly proclaiming similar views. When the time arrived for the President-elect to go to the capital of the nation to be sworn into office, it was deemed unsafe for him to travel not only as a president-elect, but as any private citizen should be allowed to do. Instead of going in a special car, receiving the good wishes of his constituents at all the stations along the road, he was obliged to stop on the way and to be smuggled into the capital. He disappeared from public view on his journey, and the next the country knew, his arrival was announced at the Capitol. There was little doubt that he would have been assassinated if he had attempted to travel openly throughout his journey. End of section 16. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at jocclev.com.